Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our session on how to get ahead of hiring needs and volume in 2021. As I've talked to heads of recruitment and managers of talent acquisition over the past few months, I've heard a recurring theme. Many of them are faced with an urgent need to scale their efforts, often while keeping a lean recruiting team. Um, a car dealership in the UK told me they were opening a brand new arm of the business, um, a line of contact centers, which they needed to get up and running in a really short period of time without adding any new recruiters to their team. Um, a banking client in the UAE said they were getting over a thousand applications a week and their current processes just couldn't keep up with their pace of growth. And the energy company we featured in last month's webinar, their head of recruitment said because turnover was so high, her team was always on the back foot, barely keeping up with keeping recs filled, and there was no way they'd be able to hit the numbers they needed for the coming year. Um, not without a change. Companies today have outgrown traditional recruitment and are looking to technology to help them scale their efforts and handle more volume with the same or less recruitment resources. That's what we're gonna talk about today with our guests from the Alliance for Inclusive AI, which is part of UC Berkeley's Haas School of Business. Um, Gautier and Lina, thank you so much for being here. Um, we'll hear from both of you in just a moment about the AI training program you're recruiting for and how you plan to scale um, up for next year. First, I'd like to say thank you to everyone for being here with us. I know it's a busy time of year and there's still a big question mark around when we get to return to offices and if we'll face more lockdown measures in the coming months. I hope that by sharing some tips and strategies with you today, you'll feel as prepared as you can be going into 2021. My name is Brianna Harper and I'm your webinar host. I'm also your resource for any questions you have during the session or anytime after. We've planned about 45 minutes of content today, and after that, we'll open it up to Q&A. If you have any questions or comments along the way, please chat in. You don't have to wait till the very end to get your questions in. Um, after the session, I'll send out today's slide deck and a link to the recording. If you have any questions we don't get to today or that you think of after the session, please reach out. You can email me at bharper at outmatch.com or find me on social at outmatchhcm. So now I'll let you hear from the real stars of the show. Uh, Gautier and Lena are both from UC Berkeley's Alliance for Inclusive AI, where they built a program and really an ecosystem to support women and underrepresented minorities in the field of AI and analytics. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about both of you. Uh, Gautier, let's start with you. All right, so yeah, this is me, Gautier. I'm gonna be with you actually for the first half hour. I gotta run to uh, all the classes later in the day. Mm -hmm. I am the co-founder and co-president of the Berkeley Alliance for Inclusive AI, and this all came together as I built a passion for data that started in business, finance, and marketing. That got completed by a decade in high tech in companies such as Oracle, Google, and later a few startups in Silicon Valley. And then I decided uh, it was high time for me to share this passion, this knowledge, this expertise, and how my teams and I um, really learned how to do data properly and hence me joining uh, the field of education and the field of diversity and inclusion, which is now our battlefront, our new frontier to, um, to bring data awareness and expertise. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, Lena, can you tell us a little bit more about you? Hi everyone, so I'm Lena. I'm a recent graduate and during my last year of masters at UC Berkeley, I joined Gauthier for uh, the Alliance for an Inclusive AI. I was just looking for a side project to work on uh, beside my studies and I ended up with this amazing project. Um, I arrived in the beginning and now I'm heading operations. So basically I'm working for recruitment and to set up the whole process to find our new recruits and then onboard them to the classes and then following up with them. Um, yeah, and so now I'm doing this as a side job. I also have a day job in addition to this. Thank you. I'm really excited to get more into that, but I wanted to quickly share um, a couple things we have coming up. Um, so before we begin, I just want to highlight some of the really exciting things that are happening at Outmatch. Um, we recently acquired three companies, Launchpad, First Person, and Chexter. 
So we're going to be hosting a series of webinars in early December to introduce these companies and really the combined capabilities that we're building into our new talent decision platform. So at Outmatch, our flagship products have really been assessment and video interviewing. Um, we're adding a layer of recruitment automation through Launchpad. Um, we're adding simulations through first person. And then we're adding automated reference checking um, and some other really cool kind of post-hire insights with uh, Checkster. So if you want to learn more about any of those, um, please send me an email or respond to some of my follow-up emails after the session today, and I'll get you booked into those. All right, and then one more thing before we dive into the, the discussion today. I just wanted to do a quick poll to pulse the audience um, on what's driving your need to scale recruitment. So I'm gonna launch this poll, and if you could uh, put in your answers, that'll just give us a better idea of what to talk to you in today's discussion. All right, so you've got that poll up on your screen. Um, just take a quick second or two to answer in for us. Are you growing, expanding, and you just have more recs to fill next year, so you need to prepare for that? Um, are you seeing an increased applicant flow? This could be because of the type of business you're in or because of the high unemployment market we're facing today. Um, do you need to keep a lean recruitment team or even cut back resources? And that's something I've heard a lot this year. Or all of the above. So just a combination of a lot of things coming together all at once. All right. So we've got the last couple of votes in and then I'll share this with everyone. All right, I think not surprising to see um, a good chunk of votes in the all of the above category, you know, followed by needing to keep a lean recruitment team or cutting back recruitment resources. Um, I think that's just really a common thing that's happening um, that we can all relate to right now. So thank you for um, doing that poll with us and we will get going into the conversation. Okay, so let's start uh, by learning a little bit more about the Alliance for Inclusive AI. Uh, Gautier, can you tell us what this organization is all about and why you co-founded it? Yes, and actually you, you did a pretty good job at summarizing it at the beginning, Brianna. Mm -hmm. Um, our, our goal is really to create an ecosystem for women, uh, minorities, and underserved communities to either gain awareness on data or to reskill, upskill, and find opportunities in the field of data. And that, that supports um, um, a, few, a few key elements for us. Uh, the first is that women, uh, minorities, are obviously underrepresented in the field of data, and that's, well, that shouldn't be the case. Uh, second, um, there is um, a need for companies to recruit new talents and they can't find them. So we have to sort of produce or upskill and reskill these talents for companies to hire. And, and the last element is um, uh, that that's really something we see more and more in machine learning projects is the, uh, what's, what's going to hurt us the most is not understanding machine learning and algorithm and, and all in all. It's really about the diversity and the unbiased views we're going to infuse into these algorithms and in this way of work, working with data. And, and it appears today that diversity is one of the most important elements to gather when you step into advanced analytics. So that's what also what we will, we're solving. Uh, I, have, I usually say to my students, you know, it's, it's their role to bring that diversity to uh, prevent um, 1984 from actually happening. Yeah, I like that. I mean, I think uh, for the last decade and more, you know, we've seen this concept of lack of women, lack of minorities in STEM fields. Um, and this is really something that's working towards a solution to that. So I think we can all talk about that. We can all agree on that kind of lack of diversity there. Um, but I love that this is this is a program that's really driving into that problem. Um, yeah, actually, yeah. The, yeah. And just add up one little thing, uh, uh, Brianna, you know, for for the audience. And I, I love I love pushing people around with some uh, strong statement, uh, you know, just mm -hmm. to make us move. Um, of course, it's good to have, have diversity and, and a broad array of people around data. But you know what? If Let's not even do it because it's good. 
let's do mm. it because it's necessary it's an absolute necessity if we want ethical humane and and relevant data in the future absolutely so can you tell me about the relationship of this program um how it's connected with uc berkeley well it was it was founded and embedded uh, in my research center the fisher center for business analytics which is part of the Institute for Business Innovation at Berkeley. And uh, that, um, that project came along with a wonderful woman, uh, Bina Amanat. She is now um, executive director of uh, the AI Foundation at Deloitte. And it's, it's funny, it was all over lunch and she said to me, okay, we need to change this. And you mm. can, you, you represent an institution that has power, that has clout, that has a name out there. And she actually had a very wide network of, of women and minority on her end. And we say, okay, let's do this. So that's how we all came together and rapidly. And that's an invite to all our audience. You, you can help us and you can participate to, to, these, uh, to these training and, and awareness programs. Um, ra rapidly, we had uh, great sponsors uh, coming to, to, to help, to support, such as uh, Google, such as Cognizant, such as Genentech, Nutanix. All these people said, we, we believe in, in, in diversity and data, and we want to contribute to helping you train um, not only women and minorities, but also our people, so that they get trained mm -hmm. along with uh, uh, these diverse crowds. So that's how it yeah. started. Yeah, so really two avenues for entry, two different um, ways to look and solve this problem. That's really great. Um, Lena, you told us a little bit about how you got involved um, with this program. Is there anything you want to add to that? Um, yeah, so to get the details, my last year was at UC Berkeley and I just needed to find, a, at first it was just, I needed to find a project to do kind of uh, like master final project to present at the end of the year. I needed to spend like 10, 10 hours a day, uh, 10 hours uh, a week <laughs> on the project and uh, almost uh, I found, I found out about projects projects just by a common relationship and I ended up being much more involved than I planned to that I the time I really was planning on spending on this project because I found it so interesting mm -hmm. um, it's a really interesting environment that Gautier has created because as he said it's all the sponsors they are here they are not just sending us money they are getting involved when we are creating uh, if we are organizing any webinar or symposium, they are actually coming and uh, presenting what they are doing in their company, talking with our students, um, and then our students have a direct contact in the sponsors. We want really to involve them in the program. We don't want just to like take their money and then we do the whole thing. Um, and so I think that's really something valuable. And when the students have come back to us after the trainings, that's also what they have been saying, that they really feel like it's a community. Uh, they keep, keep coming back to us when they need something career wise or even sometimes some personal projects. Um, and I really like this dynamic that we can find among this community. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, so Gautier, I'll go back to you with this question. Um, as you're thinking about driving diversity into the field of AI and data analytics and you're recruiting people into this program, what makes someone a good candidate um, for this program, but really what makes someone a good candidate for a career in data science? Like, what are you looking for in these trainings? Yeah, and actually, um, uh, that's going to surprise uh, m many many of us uh, today uh, on this webinar, and that's um, and also guys. I mean, that's sincere. That's why we we're partnering with you guys at Outmatch, because uh, what we're looking for is actually very counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. um, we have a tendency to say data uh, is all about technology and hard skills. Now nah, there's a little bit of this, but you know what? I've I've been teaching uh, for for ten years, and I know this can be taught. There's actually not much rocket science in mastering good business analytics and even some basic machine learning. We can all achieve this with a good training. Now, what matters the most, and this is what we're really trying to get into um, uh, from, from our, our, our candidates, our trainees, is um, a combination of, uh, of passion, eagerness, because it's a whole new field they're gonna have to learn, like for many of us. So you gotta have that extra oomph to say, 
I'm going to, I'm going to go the extra mile to learn. Then we're also looking for some, some grit and some fortitude because when you, when you enter the, the, the world of analytics, it's all about iteration and fail and iterate and learn and fail and iterate. And that could be disconcerting. That could be uh, sometimes, you know, uh, take, that could take you outside your comfort zone. And, and we want people to, to, to feel strong. And that, once again, has nothing to do with uh, being book smart. It's just being a strong and good human being. And last, and last but not least, this is also something we see more and more, and it goes back to the, the bias issue we saw earlier, or the ethical problems we see around data. We, we want people with a, with a good heart, with empathy, with curiosity, with a, sort of a collaboration spirit. Because at the end of the day, that's what we see more and more today. Data projects are holistic by design. I mean, mining a small data set does no longer, no longer cuts it. You need to talk to other people. You need to sample data from different places. And therefore, you need to be a, a, a person of contact, of exchange, of sharing. So these are primarily the soft skills we're looking for, in fact. Yeah, that's really helpful because that's another one of the recurring thing, themes that I've been hearing is that recruiting teams and employers know what they're looking for in people. Um, but there's a disconnect in what they're able to do, especially in volume recruitment at scale. They're looking at resumes and they're not seeing those things you just described. They're not seeing or, or the passion isn't translated through and the ability to learn and the grit. Um, you can't get that from a resume. And in fact, when we were talking um, in preparation for this webinar, Gautier, you told me that you stopped looking at resumes in your career 10 years ago. So can you expand on what that's been like for you? Yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, <laughs> looking at resumes is boring. <laughs> I mean, it takes time and you know it's fabricated. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, I, I personally spent hours, hundreds of hours on my resume and it's all, I mean, it's not that it's make believe, but it's all nice and fine. And, and it boils down to, um, you know, at the end, like a, a checklist of, okay, okay of, you can do this, you can't do this, you can do this and you're good at that. But like I said, I think in data, it, it's far from being enough. You need to see what the person really is. You need to, to feel that courage and that, that um, eagerness to make things happen. And, and I, I, uh, that was by my time in, in a large internet company, which was really focused on hiring the top of a creme of a creme of, of, of the best universities. And I realized that, yes, I mean, these kids were good. But come on, they were all the same, all cookie cutter and all with the same opinions and the same way of working. And for me, it was very disconcerting to spend like hours looking at the resume. I wanted something else, something I could only get through a conversation. But the problem mm. is, was that the conversation wouldn't scale. So, um, well, I rapidly shifted to, you know, forget the resume, come and talk to me. And um, I mean, here, you know, we're here to, to talk about, you know, business and operations. But this is where, I mean, a solution like Outmatch really fit the bill because scaling conversation is very hard. So we needed a tool to scale that part. And voila, we felt that the video gathering of this information was actually probably the most, um, uh, the, the richest way of capturing what we wanted. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so another thing you said as we were preparing for this webinar, I mean, you obviously uh, have a passion for driving uh, diversity and inclusion um, into this field. That's why this program exists. Um, you said that you have to lower the barriers and give people a chance. Um, so how are you doing that um, in the way you recruit people into this program? And how does Outmatch Video help you with that? Yeah, so... Um... And so once again, uh, my, my colleague Lena is here, but she'll talk more on the second mm -hmm. half because I, I need to go once again. So that's why we, we, we gave priority that way. But uh, guys, that, that's going to sound like very up. And you're going to say, OK, these guys are just lunatics. After all, they're from Berkeley. You know, Berkeley has always <laughs> been very like on the progressive side. Like, OK, <laughs> you know, no, but, but get that. At the end of the day, for most of the job we do, and I've been in finance and supply chain, uh, so I know some jobs can be technical, but for a lot of things we do every day, um, there's no rocket science. Yeah, there's some basic stuff that you need to know for sure, 
But in my opinion, where employees are going to make a difference is not on the sort of background they bring, is how they're going to merge, they're going to, they're going to fit into their environment. And the energy, the eagerness to look further and to innovate and collaborate, that's, that's the energy we're looking for, or I am looking for. Because the backbone of it, the hard skills, even if you have some holes, I pay you a training, you fill up these holes, you're done. And, and, and this is really why, um, we, why uh, we wanted to, uh, to, to uh, focus with our match on this type of qualities is how do we capture uh, these, um, these elements from people. Now here's the issue, that's also another issue, is um, you can still ask uh, people to write an essay, uh, you can still ask people to, uh, to travel and come and see you, but that immediately creates barrier, as Brian I was, um, was saying. Uh, barriers because you know what if I'm not book smart writing an essay is complex for me and to be an, an analyst to be a, um, a assistant accountant I don't need to write essays anyway so we didn't want any of this to get in the way of great people saying I love to apply for this I love to become a data girl the problem is you ask me to write a 200 page memo to show me my my thesis or anything like this that's not fair to you and um we felt that uh, we could lower these barriers. I'm not saying the barriers in terms like you got to be a great person, that is non-negotiable, mm -hmm. but the barriers in terms of communication. And some people, you know, everybody today has um, an ability to take a phone and record. We all do this. I mean, I, I don't really do this, but it's something that has gotten very mainstream. So for mm -hmm. us, uh, this video media is actually second nature to a lot of people, mostly in the younger generation. So capturing what they feel, what they want to do and their passion through this, for us, it's the easiest way. And there's no you know, excuse you know, about, I don't know how to write, et cetera, et cetera. Even if I don't have any computer right now, I can use my phone and do the job. And so you, you combine these two things, these two elements I just described. And in our opinion, that gave us the, the best ability to not miss any talent out there and to give everybody a chance which in a more corporate world, uh, in, in a time where you're looking for talents and talents know their talents, so they're expensive and they're hard to get, well, just widen the spectrum because there's so many great people out there that you can hire that want to work for you. It's gonna take what, 15 hours of training? You'll ramp them up and it'd be super good. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, I have another question for you. Um, so you videos instead of resumes to recruit trainees. How does this reflect on your program, its mission, and really the culture at UC Berkeley? Well, uh, um, I think this. Um, the, I'm, I'm not a you know a geek person just to use the latest and the greatest for the sake of being the latest and the greatest. But I think also it, it reflects on our program. It reflects on um, you know yes we support diversity. But yes, we're diverse in how we run this organization because it's pretty much half women and half men and a lot of variation uh, all in between. And yes, we, we also want to show that um, we're innovative, we're creative about how we run things. And that's why Outmatch, I mean, uh, video recruiting for us was also a clear sign to say, um, we are so eager to change the game in the way you guys are being recruited. So it's, it's, a, it's an overall statement for us to show that, um, you know, at, at UC Berkeley in general and at the Institute for Business Innovation in particular, uh, we are always trying to, to find what's best to serve businesses, either in running or recruitment. And, you know, for recruitment, that was definitely a great option. Thank you so much. I know that uh, we only had you for a little bit of the session today. Um, so that's all the questions I have for you. Thank you so much for joining us. If anybody listening in has questions for Gautier, uh, please reach out to me after the session and not, I can connect you. Um, all right. So now, uh, Lena, I'm going to turn it over to you with a few questions. All right. So I'll, I'll leave you for now, guys. I'm going to jump to my next, uh, my next class. All right. Thank you for having me, Brianna. Thank you so much. Over to you, Lena. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.
Um, all right, Lena. So when we first talked, you gave a really great example of how you're re-envisioning recruitment. Um, you said in traditional recruitment, that the process is really to check some boxes and then decide if someone's skills are a good fit for the job or for your, your culture. Um, and that's really not the approach you're taking. So can you elaborate on this for us? Yeah, sure. So the way I envision um, like conventional recruiting is that first recruiters will look at your resume and possibly also your cover letter and check the boxes they need for the for the specific role they are recruiting for. Um, the issue is if you are only recruiting people, let's say for Berkeley, from Berkeley or Stanford then for your diversity need you are actually depending on if berkeley or stanford are already doing diversity work if they're not and you are already recruiting in a homogeneous uh, group um and also there is another issue with that which is like i don't have the exact survey in mind but i know these are famous numbers um like a man will Will apply, will apply for a job when he has something like 50 or 60 percent of the boxes checked, when a woman will wait to have like 80 percent. Of course, it's an average; it depends on people. But I can completely recognize myself in that. Um, but when you are starting with a video, it's like you are first looking at the soft skills, the diversity in the training, the diversity in the path they have the person has done until now. And once this person has the soft skills or like represents the kind of personality that you want to recruit, then you will talk to the person, then you will probably look at the resume if you want to, and then you will check if they there are like the minimum requirement on the hard skills side. Um, and also on a recruit on a new recruit point of view, the um, the video, as Gauthier talked about before, is a very different kind of barrier compared to a resume. Um, I know that some people, maybe most people, <laughs> will be more comfortable talking about themselves than writing about themselves. It's more spontaneous. Um, it asks for maybe a bit more creativity or a bit more motivation, but motivation is something that we want in a candidate when the ability to write a nice text the ability to sell yourself with a nice design on your resume may not be uh, like the first thing you are looking for maybe like sponta being spontaneous is more important so yeah to sum it up instead of first checking the hard skills and then checking if among this person you're selected there is someone who corresponds to the kind of person and person as a personality you want to recruit first you check the soft skills and then among this person you check the hard skills and if something is missing it's probably all right because if you did the first part right it will make up for the second part uh, if you are motivated smart creative uh, like proactive you'll be able to learn the next skills at least for uh, data science for the kind of work we are training yeah, and that expands on a lot of the things that I heard Gautier say as well, that it's it's about aligning the recruitment process and the recruitment experience to what you actually need someone to do in the job. So being a master communicator or a brilliant um, self-biographer um, who, can, who can write a really great resume, if that has nothing to do with the job they're going to be doing, then it kind of seems like a no-brainer right? <laughs> to really cut that out. Um, and I love to hear that much video can really help put a lens on the things that you are looking for. Like you said, uh, creativity, passion, energy, all the things that are just not going to come through on a resume. So beyond the fact that they're not fun, it's not fun to spend hours reading, sorting through resumes, um, especially when they're all very generic and most of them say the same things over and over again. When you see a person on that video, you can really get a sense for who they are, what that the personality and the attitudes and the motivations, um, and what they're going to be like to work with, and how how um, eager they are to learn, really are the things that are important. Um, so I, I, I heard a lot of that in what you said and what Gautier said, and I'm, I just, I love that it's kind of all coming together. Um, 
had you, I'm curious because um, you don't really come from the world of recruiting. I wonder if it, it maybe it was uh, easier for you to kind of look at it a different way because you didn't have the the legacy of doing it one way, you know, for years before. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I can completely agree with that. This was the first kind of recruitment I ever did. I did not do it on my own, right? We were a team and we talked about that. We talked about what we were looking for and uh, like what was the best way to come up with something like that. Um, something also that was a real challenge for me as someone new to the recruitment field is that um, I had to get rid of all stereotypes or mm. all the this kind of ideas that you can get from a resume or like anything actually we're all full of stereotypes and biases and i know about that i'm not an exception um and so when you have a video it kind of breaks this image this image that you can get from someone just from the resume because uh, the person talks directly to you and the tone on the voice the thing that the person will say, I was surprised to see people talk about their family, their kids, uh, what is motivating them to, to work, what is passioning them. I was really surprised to see people open up when it's just a video, like a two minutes video. They are not really, I mean, they are talking to me, but they not see me directly. Um, but yeah, that's really changed this way I saw recruiting when I was always on the other side. And because mm. I, I followed a very well, stereotype path because I, I mean, I, I did a business school, then I went to do my last year abroad, and it was always really like academic. Mm. And when I searched for internships or for jobs, it was always resume, cover letter, first interview, second interview. And some of them went well, some of them went not well, but they all well felt like there was something that the recruiter did not get about me. Mm. That was more than just. Uh, my school or my grades or something like that yeah so what i really love about your story is that you were able to come into this with really fresh eyes on how you wanted to really build this recruitment process for this program um and i imagine if if you're listening in and you're at a bigger company that's got a lot of these legacy processes and traditional recruitment has been rooted into the way things have been done for years and years it's going to take some work to to pull out some of those old systems and processes. Um, but what we have here is a really a success story of how well it works without all the legacy stuff, um, you know, and, and when you've been able to build from the ground up something that's really efficient, works really well for you. Yeah. Um, I've got another question for you here. So let's circle back now to the title of the webinar, which is how to get ahead of hiring needs and volume in 2021. Um, that's all about scalability. So Lena, in spite of COVID, I know you've gotten 300 people into the program this year and your goal for next year is a thousand. So that's more than a three times increase. Um, and I, I would imagine that a lot of you on the call are having similar uh, leaps, you know, similar goals that you're after for next year. So there's certainly a sourcing component to that, uh, but you also need to be able to manage more applications and prioritize and select the right people um, all in greater volume. So how do you see Outmatch Video supporting you as you scale? Mm, um, so first of all, you said this light of COVID, but something surprising was that COVID actually helped us. I mean, of course, COVID is terrible, but for recruiting, it was easier because before that, we, we had time just to organize one training in person in Berkeley. And for this one, we had to find someone, we had to find people that were in the area, close enough to come to Berkeley every day. And still we wanted some like a diverse population. So diverse population, but in a specific location. Mm -hmm. And then if people were a bit abroad, we had to pay for everything because we did not want the price to be an obstacle, uh, to be a barrier. So we had to pay for the, like the commute, the food, everything. And so when we decided to move to remote, I mean, we did not really have a choice, but we adapted to move to like a remote class, an online class. This just opened so much more possibilities because all of a sudden we could recruit anywhere in the world. 
and uh, the price wasn't a barrier anymore because it was completely free. There is no commute, no lodging, not anything like that. So that's what helped us recruiting more and more broadly. That was really that was really interesting to see people waking up in the middle of the night in France or even in China to attend a webinar that was in the afternoon in um, in the US. <laughs> and so for next year, um, hopefully we'll be able to go back to in-person classes. But even if we do, I'm sure we will also keep at least like half of our classes in an online format just for these reasons. Um, and to go back to like the scalability issue, I think we already mentioned that before, but uh, we want to talk to people. We can't organize an interview with me and someone else for every single candidate. I mean, with 300, it may be possible, it would take a lot of time. With 1,000, it's not possible anymore if I'm the only one. Um, so we will recruit more people, but also we can just re-record the interviews and just watch them one after the other and do a first selection like that and see if this person, the person applying uh, corresponds to what we're looking for, corresponds to the passion and creativity and energy that we're um, I think this will be really helpful to just be able to navigate through the profiles before uh, contacting them and without having to just read through resumes. Of course, the, back, the like downside of that is that a resume or cover letter is much faster to look at. It can take like mm. two mm. minutes and that's it. Here it will take a bit more time, but I feel like it's a good compromise because we see more of the person, a fairer um, process, and still it's much faster than meeting in person with every single candidate, which we couldn't do. Yeah, because that's what you're trying to scale is the, the conversation, the meeting, the first impression with these candidates because um, you're not getting what you need. Uh, you wouldn't get what you need from the resume. Um, and I, I mentioned one of our banking clients earlier in the webinar. I mean, another thing he said was when you get on one of those initial phone calls with a candidate, you know in the first five minutes whether or not you want to proceed with them. Um, and, and if you don't want to proceed with them, you're still talking to them for 30 minutes. You still got that blocked off. Um, with something like Amatch Video, you can pull up you know, a, a five to 10 minute recording of someone um, and get that same sense of a person's personality and, and energy and motivation um, and fit without committing yourself to 30 minute blocks of time only during business hours. You know, there's just the whole added um, convenience to it. So yeah, that as well. Yeah, that's true. Like at the moment, we have about 10 minutes of video per person because I think we have like four questions, two minutes per video. Everyone does a different time, but then it's like eight minutes. Sometimes it will be less, sometimes more. And it's true that if someone just doesn't fit, I know it from the beginning and I just cut it there. But then where I know I can make a lot of progress and that's where I'm lacking experience in recruitment, but I'm learning. <laughs> is um, I need to find the right question to really uh, see, to really, how can I say, the focus on what we are looking for. So far I have four questions. I'm sure I could do the same work with like one or two questions. And mm. what I'm feeling guilty about is that, honestly, when I have a lot of, of uh, applicants, I won't watch all five videos or all four videos for each applicant, but they did take the time to, to do it. So taking the time to record them, show me their motivation. But at the same time, as an applicant myself or other things, if I take the time to do that, I want some time, someone to take the time to watch them. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to find a system where if someone can be a fit, I can find the time to watch all the videos and actually know what I'm looking for in these videos more than I know right now. Um, so this is another, yeah, another uh, challenge because it's easier to pinpoint a skill in a resume than in a video because it's different kind of skills. 
Yeah, because if you're looking for um, you, number of years of experience, that's easy to see. If you're looking for where someone went to school, um, that's easy to see. But this, we get a little bit more complex into these soft skills, which really are the most important factor is what I'm hearing. So um, finding that balance between knowing what's asked to pull out exactly what it is you're looking for um, in even less time sounds like uh, certainly a worthy challenge to embark on. All right, yeah. so I'll move um, into, into Outmatch Video a little bit more. Um, I'm curious, so from a usability standpoint, what's your favorite thing about the product? Hmm. Um, so of course I like, like the, the like main thing of the product, which is being able to see the video. It's easy to see, easy to, to navigate through the different questions. You have like three kind of, uh, of question you can ask, like the video one, a survey and a text and essay. And it's really easy to navigate through the, through the three of them. But what I like most, I think, is the fact that when someone click on the link and doesn't pass the interview, you can also see it because on the tracking point of view and data point of view, you can see if people are actually clicking on your link, if they are passing the first question or not. Mm. And that may also indicate like, why do people click on it? I mean, they are interested. Why do they not pass the first video? Is it too difficult? Is it just like they are not the kind of person we look for and this is why they are not doing the first video it's i just like the fact that we're able to track what people did and where they stopped even if they didn't complete the whole process yeah so just even giving you an idea with some analytics um how how people are working through this process um where there was just a lot of obscurity um, before, you know, even even the analytics aren't giving you answers, they're just giving you questions to ask, you at least know what questions to ask. So I think it's one of yeah. All right, my next question for you is, uh, what advice do you have for people using a tool like Outmatch Video? Um, so if you, if you haven't used something like this before and you're trying to get started, what would you say to people? Um, I would say to put yourself in the place of the applicant. Mm. Um, so you have a question and you have to record yourself uh, answering it. Maybe it's the first time you do this, maybe you never heard about it before. So what I did for that is I filmed myself, I recorded myself asking the video. And that's also a very good option with Outmatch, like not a lot of uh, platform offer this. So I recorded myself asking the question the same way I want the applicant to record himself or herself answering the question. Um, and I feel like it's breaking the video barrier a bit because mm -hmm. it's like you get an example, I'm showing my face, uh, I'm doing it naturally. So the person in front of me will just film himself or herself with a, like, in selfie mode. And I think like it makes it more casual. Um, just try to imagine what barriers the applicant is facing. Yeah, I, I love that. I think that's great advice, you know, for all of the candidate experience, you know, walking through every step that someone has to go through, um, because at some point you become far removed from it, right? You know, we've all been job candidates, we've all applied for jobs and gone through processes, but you know, the longer we're in a role at our current companies, the more we forget about what that's like. So I think that's a great point. Um, and what you're mentioning, you know, there are similar tools out there when you're doing video interviewing, which would be, you know, asking someone a question and they're recording their answer um, even before any live interviews happen. Um, there are tools out there that just kind of put the question up in text on the screen and it feels very one directional. Um, so it's just a person alone in their house looking at their webcam answering these kind of written out questions but you know what we really tried to do is make this as conversational as possible so we we encourage uh recruiters and teams to record themselves asking the questions um i even had someone uh, one of our 
data analytics companies we work with showed me some of her videos that she created last year before COVID, but she was in the recruiting studio at the campus and just kind of showing people around. So it's not just pulling information from the candidate, it's actually introducing them to your culture as well. So um, I love to hear that, that you're taking advantage of that as well. Yeah, it's really helpful. And since we're talking about other platforms, something I really liked about Outmatch is how simple it is. Like every, of mm -hmm. course, every company has different needs. Um, and according to your needs, it will suit you or not. But before finding you, I've been looking for a lot of platforms and nothing suits a small company such as ours with simple needs. It's either the most simple thing like uh, Google Form. And if you want a video, then you have to ask a person to upload it on, uh, on Drive or something like that. Or it's something much more complex where it's made to scale to like thousands and thousands of applicants. And then you have all these systems that analyzes, like with intelligence, artificial intelligence, analyzes your face, analyzes your, um, your emotions, what you're saying. And then it completely breaks down the, like, the spontaneity and the casualty of the conversation. You don't really see people. You see people that an AI that you don't know really how it works wants to show you. And that's another kind of recruiting, but not what we need and definitely not what we're looking for right now. So I liked how simple it was while giving us exactly what we needed. Yeah, and you pointed out being, um, you know, a small company and yet, you know, thinking back to that 3x increase that you're looking to get next year, you know, three times more candidates into the program than you had this year. I mean, that's comparable to what big companies are doing as well. So I think um, the whole idea of scaling is is common throughout, regardless of how big you are um, and getting to a thousand. I mean, that's that's a lot. <laughs> Um, and I know even big companies have small recruiting teams. So I think this challenge is pretty common across the board. Yeah, I agree. Um, I've got one more question for you. Um, and anybody listening in, if you have questions, uh, please write them in now and we'll hang on the line to answer any of those that come in. Um, so Lena, my last question for you, uh, what lessons have you learned or what are your biggest takeaways from doing video driven recruitment? Um, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I, from recruitment in general, it's just how do you ask the right questions mm. to see the skill? I mean, I, I know it's a very, it's the basics of recruitment, but again, again, like I'm new to it. So I discovered that. And from video recruitment, I learned a lot about how much more you learn from someone by speaking with them, I mean, at the level of what we're doing right now, how much more you learn by speaking than by reading about them. Because mm -hmm. there is a whole language that's not written. You could, I mean, you could write your text and then read it. But then there is the body language, the eyes, uh, the expression of the face, sometimes you see the hands, and that's, much that's saying much more than the words themselves like the intonation and all it's much more than just the word or the, the text that you would read and that then you could write somewhere else um so it goes beyond recruitment it's like especially now uh, when we're all working from home seeing less people mm -hmm. you can write to friends it's not the same way it's not the same as speaking with them and speaking with them on the phone is not the same as speaking with them on zoom or hopefully for the most lucky of us like in person <laughs> um, and when recruiting is the same it's like you get to know maybe not a friend but a future colleague which is just as important, you don't want to work with some people and you do want to work with other people. And so a conversation, a face-to-face -face conversation will tell you much more than just the text. Yeah, I mean, there's been an explosion of video this past year. I mean, we really had to lean into that because people are so badly missing those personal connections that they can't get from the in-person interactions, at least for now. Um, so certainly companies were adopting uh, video recruitment solutions before COVID. Um, there was certainly a need for that and um, to solve efficiency challenges, um, scalability challenges. 
but this personal element has become more important than ever. Um, so I think we've all realized that and we've all become even more comfortable with video than we were before. I mean, I remember doing um, even meetings with colleagues at Outmatch who didn't live in the same city as me and we would just, um, you know, not even turn our webcams on. And I think there's just been a real uh, shift in that to where the candidates you're recruiting um, are more comfortable than ever being on video. And so it, it makes sense for them. It makes sense for you as a recruiting team. Um, it's really kind of connecting the dots there in a win-win situation for everyone. Yeah, exactly. All right, Lena, thank you so much for your time. I loved hearing your story um, and your best practices and tips throughout the session today. Um, if anyone has questions for me or Gautier or Lena um, that you think of after the session today, please email me. Um, I'll send out my contact information. Um, and I hope to see you back at our next few events. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot, Brianna. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>